This is a 2022 Hyundai Ioniq 5 all-wheel drive. And this is actually the first non-Tesla EV I've driven since I purchased my Model 3 in 2018. Now, this is my friend's car, and he was gracious enough to let me drive it for a couple of days. And of course, in return, he's driving my Tesla Model 3. Now, I do recognize the fact that a more fair comparison would be to that of a Tesla Model Y. But with that said, I'm Frugal Tesla Guy, and I'm going to give you my overall thoughts on this car. And not necessarily whether or not I'd replace my Model 3 with it, but rather would I consider purchasing this car as a second EV in my garage. purchased my Tesla Model 3 long range rear wheel drive in 2018, there really weren't that many affordable EV options that didn't break the bank, especially if you wanted something over 200 miles. The only car available that was affordable at that point was the Chevy Bolt. Of course, that was available for the more expensive Tesla Model 3. Fast forward four years later and a lot has changed. Many people who are in the market to get a new car now have the option to switch over to EV. You know, we're seeing a lot more mass production of EVs from several different companies and that is basically bringing the price down and opening the market up to more people. Take the Hyundai Ioniq 5. It starts at just under $40,000 with a, about a 220 mile range. Add about $4,000 to that and now you bump that range up to a little over 300 miles. Now the Hyundai Ioniq 5 that we're looking at here almost has every available option, kind of bumping that price up pretty high over $50,000. It also has all wheel drive which is going to take that range down to a little over 250 miles and that's to be expected pretty much with any all wheel drive electric vehicle. And as we all know, there are also several advantages to having that all wheel drive. Now, before we dive into the review, it should be noted that I am in no shape or form a car professional. I am just an EV enthusiast and an average guy who wants to share his experience after driving this car for about two days. So with that in mind, let's get right to it. Now, upon getting into the car, it actually feels quite spacious, and I think for two reasons. Number one, you can see what looks kind of like these white interior. Hyundai calls it a gray two-tone interior. They're leatherette seats, and they actually re look really nice. You've got this nice accent right here uh, and some good stitching in here as well. And on top of that, they not only look nice, but they're actually quite comfortable as well. Now, another reason why this car feels so spacious is you can't see it from your perspective, but above me, is this beautiful panoramic sunroof. And it reminds me a lot of the Tesla Model Y without that center pillar there. And one thing I did notice though, is that the panoramic roof doesn't come as far forward as the Tesla Model 3 or Y. But there's a reason for that. And quite honestly, a good reason as well. Because if you wanna block out the sun on those hot summer days, all you have to do is push this button right here and it closes off that panoramic roof. Now again, it does take some of the real estate, if you will, of that panoramic roof, but quite honestly, I think it comes at a good cost because it does prevent on those hot summer days, it prevents the air conditioning from working as hard. And also, it ha if it has to be out parked in a parking lot for several hours, that's gonna help keep the cabin a little bit cooler as well. Speaking of space, one of the things that I like is this center console. This is a cool feature, and I think it's really neat when manufacturers and designers think about things like this, because this is something that I would actually personally use, and my wife in particular. I'll show you what I'm talking about. So you've got this center console right here. You can move this back for more space right here. 
Now, a lot of people think, well, why would you need all that space there? And for us, my wife, when we go on road trips, she usually has at least two bags up front with her. So this would be a great opportunity and a great space for her to put her bags, and then she would have more leg room uh, in the passenger seat with her. And of course, without those road trips, you can do this. And I think it's also neat too, because I'm sure there are gonna be all kinds of great aftermarket products that you'll be able to buy with that extra space if you don't necessarily need that. But again, just one more simple design that may seem use useless to some, but I think others will really appreciate it. Now, honestly, I don't know how I feel about the instrument cluster behind the wheel and the touchscreen right next to it. Now, this is not a touchscreen right here. The way you change the information being displayed is with this button right here. There's a button right here. You can kind of change between the different screens. So what you can do is change that screen and then one of these wheels, you can also change more information from there. So that's pretty neat. That's pretty much to be expected. You probably don't want that to be a touch screen anyways. It's gonna be hard to do that through the wheel. This is the touch screen to the right. Overall, it gets the job done. And for the most part, I was able to easily find what I was looking for. But the screen does feel a bit laggy and unresponsive at times, especially in maps. Now in the day and age of smartphones, people are going to want the same feel on their car's touchscreen. And I would say this is the one area the Ionic 5 falls short. Now there are several physical buttons that give you the quick access to features that most people use on a regular basis including the satisfaction of turning an actual dial to increase the volume of your music. Imagine that. There's also quick access to climate control, and most of those controls and more can be accessed on the touchscreen. And what I find interesting is the climate control buttons are not physical, but have more of a touchscreen feel. That said, it is very responsive, and I never had any problems using climate control. And as crazy as this sounds, one of my favorite features is the head-up display. This is something I've heard a lot of people talking about in the Tesla community, but I had never really experienced it. But once I saw it in action, I can see now why many people rave about it. And in my opinion, it's not distracting at all and is the safest way to get all of the vital information you need without taking your eyes off the road. So let's talk about the overall experience of this car. Now, a couple of the things to keep in mind. Number one, I don't want to compare it to that of the Tesla Model 3 and even the Model Y. I've driven the Model Y several times, but it's been a while since I have, so my recent memory isn't gonna be a good comparison. And then in comparison it to the Model 3, that's terrible because the Model 3 feels more like a sports car. Tighter suspension, tighter steering, great acceleration. So with this car, if you go into it with the right expectations, I don't think you're going to be disappointed. Now, another thing you have to keep in mind is this. I'm not a professional driver. I have a job outside of this. I don't review cars for a living. But what I can tell you is this. Since I've been driving at the age of 16, I've been driving cars, right? And I've driven a lot of cars in those years. And there's nothing on the negative side on this car that sticks out like a sore thumb. Nothing, absolutely nothing. The driving experience is great. I can't complain really about anything. The steering is fine, the suspension. Now, if I do this, do that kind of little wobble test, yeah, the suspension is a bit softer. In fact, a lot softer than out of the Model 3. But that's to be expected, it's not a sports car. This is a family crossover. If you go into that frame of mind, you're not gonna be disappointed. And here's another thing, you're not gonna be disappointed with that acceleration, and in fact, and the one thing that I will compare it to the Model 3 is the acceleration. It's really close. I mean, so close that it almost feels like it's similar. So this will not disappoint in the category of acceleration. When you want that power, when you need that power, the car is going to give it to you. Now, speaking of speed and acceleration, I learned a very quick lesson about the different modes. You got eco, normal, and sport mode. Now, the first time I tried an off the line speed test, I was in normal mode. And there was about a quarter to a half a second delay before the car actually responded. And once it did go, I was impressed, but I was a little underwhelmed because of the fact of that delay. Well, it turns out, again, I was in normal mode, didn't realize it. So I tried it in sports mode, and let's just say 
it was a completely different story. Car going. Ready? One, two, three. Oh. <laughs> Now I can honestly say that this Ionic 5 all-wheel drive is actually faster off the line than my 2018 Tesla Model 3 long-range rear-wheel drive. And now this is one of the advantages I was talking about earlier about all-wheel drive. So we're going to go ahead and take this thing out for a drive now, and today is going to be an Apple-themed day. I'm heading down to Manton, California, where I've been an Apple Pie judge for over 20 years. So we're heading down there, and then we're going to head out to Paradise, California, where they've got Johnny Appleseed days. Now, this is going to give me an opportunity to test the car in a semi-mountainous terrain. It's kind of in the foothills, uh, so we're going to be going over some higher and lower elevations, testing out how it does in some of the, uh, as we start kind of getting over some of those mountain passes, like small mountain passes, and then going down to see how it does with regenerative braking. It will also allow me to check out some of the uh, fast DC charging networks around here. I'm going to be probably looking at ChargePoint and Charge Across America, so we'll check those two out as well. But right now I've got 73% of battery. That puts me at 175 miles of estimated range in normal mode, in sport mode 169 miles, and in eco mode 180 miles. So let's go ahead, put this thing in drive, and get started. So in this trip, it was about 41 miles, and I went from 73 to 53% battery, so I lost 20% of the battery. Now you'll also notice here, I've got 124 miles. That is about 50 miles of loss, I guess, if you will. So it's a saying out of a 41 mile drive, it's saying I went about 50 miles. So really overall, that is not bad. <laughs> Once I get to know it a little bit better, it'll be easier, but I was able to kind of find along the route at some charging stations. I was able to put ChargePoint in there and um, Electrify America. There are other options in there, but there are the two ones that I wanted to possibly use. So you can see here, it's got the fastest, the most cost effective. Uh, you can do more routes. So that's what I'm looking at here. So I've got about 80 miles to go and I have got 122 miles left in the battery. We'll see how close it will be, but it'll be interesting to see if I can get to Chico from here in Manton. It looks like there is a stop off near Red Bluff, which is right over here. And I do know that there are some DC fast chargers there. So I might get a better idea 
as far as how good or bad the battery is doing at that point. So let's get going. So I arrived with 28% of my battery left, uh, 20, 66 miles of estimated range. Uh, that was in, yeah, normal mode. Sport mode had 64 miles left in an eco mode. So really kind of not a very big difference between all three of those different modes. But uh, yeah, this is usually about the time, usually around 20% is when I like to, to charge. So charging a little sooner than I typically would, but I don't feel confident going up to paradise and then back on the current charge. So let's let's try Electrify America and see how it goes. So I wanna share with you my first experience with Electrify America. Now, in my case, it may be different than a lot of other people because my friend, when he bought this car, he's getting three years of free charging through Electrify America. Fantastic, right? So I didn't realize, and I didn't know how it worked, but I thought maybe it needed some kind of pin code or, or something in order to have it activate. But it turns out that when I walked up to it, I followed the instructions, I plugged the car in, and I walked back and it says initiating. Next thing I know, within about a minute, it's actually charging. And it had that same plug and charge feel, or plug and play feel, like that of the Tesla supercharging network. The only difference is it took a while before it actually started initiating. So I'll say this, from all the horror stories, I am pleasantly surprised with how smoothly this all went. And if Electrify America can get it to a point to the experience that I just had and maybe help get that initiation going a little bit faster, I think the problems we hear about with Electrify America would vanish. I was 217 when I checked in last, and by the time I got plugged in, it was probably closer to say 218 or even maybe even 220 before I started charging. So really honestly, in a little over 20 minutes, I went from 28% to 76%. That's actually a pretty good speed, and I'm pretty happy with um, how quickly it charged. So my first experience with Electrify America and just charging outside of a Tesla and the Tesla network was just a great experience. I, The only complaint, and as I mentioned earlier, was how long it took to initiate with the car. But outside of that, plug and play, started charging and charged quickly. The day that I kissed you and told you goodbye, your lips told me that you Took your lips deceived me and told me a lie Now your heart is sealing my face Are you all alone with a memory? Now that I am gone, darling Seventy-three miles right now. I'm gonna go ahead and move the camera over here. I've got uh, seventy-three miles to go, uh, and I've got 164 miles left. Uh, estimated range of the battery. Spore is 158. Eco is 168. Back to normal, 69 percent. So yeah, let's get over to the next charger. Like I said, the first charging experience was a really good one. So let's see if I can go to another Electrify America station to see if I have the same experience. All right, so as we call, I had a great experience with my first Electrify America experience. Let's go ahead and open up the charge port here. There we go. Uh, so uh, let's see if it's just the same thing. Let's see if it's gonna be plug and play. Charger unavailable. <laughs> okay, well, I think this confirms some of the issues. Let's, let's see what the other ones look like. 
Okay, this one's available. I can't see anything on this one. This one, it, the sun is blaring on it. I can't, plug in first is what I can kind of see there. Okay, so that one works. And then this one says plug in first as well. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and go to the other one. All right, so nothing to be terribly concerned about, but the one that I pulled up to obviously is the one that decided to not be working. So the other three look like they do work. So I'm just gonna pull up to the next one and let's see if it works. Okay, so I pulled up here and I'm gonna go ahead and say close this. It says plug in first, just like it did in the last one. I need to open up the charge port first. I locked the door. Um, let's see, hold it. There we go. Okay. Gotta love the diesel. Okay, so here we go. Let's go over here. Plug it in. Oh, I gotta pull this thing out first. And when I gotta hold the camera, it's a little bit more challenging. Let's get this out. There we go. Very good. These are beefy cables and plugs. Definitely a... Uh, Got that in there. Let's go over here and see what it's saying. Connecting the vehicle. Guest member, pay by credit card. Okay, so I'm gonna go member, use to use. Okay, so what's interesting is now this time it's actually asking me to use the app. So yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and use my credit card. Okay, so I've got my credit card ready. So let's see here. I just go ahead and yeah, pay, use a credit card reader to get started. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and put it in there. All right, processing payment. Payment authorized. Initiating charging, okay. So unlike the other one, it just started charging automatically. But this one wanted to use my credit card. So, I mean, I'm not complaining about that, but it's great, we got it going. And are we charging? Okay, based on this, it doesn't show that it's charging. Oh, there we go. We are now charging. Let's see if it's showing me continue. All right, now it's going to the screen here, showing me that we're up to, let's see what, what it gets up to kilowatts. I think because we're at 45% battery that it's not gonna go up to 150. So, you know, 129 is not bad. Okay, good. Give it a little bit of a charge here and see how it goes, see how long it takes. So this is a pretty neat little feature. You can really recline this seat back far. And in fact, even to the point where the angle is this seat back here, you can see right here, a nice little rest for your legs right here. So it's nice and relaxing. And while the car is charging, you, you can recharge as well. So. Pardon me while I take a little bit of a snooze. Now don't let the appearance of the Ionic 5 fool you. Once you step on that accelerator for the first time, especially in sport mode, that will be the furthest thing from your mind. But quite honestly, that's become an industry standard, quick acceleration. So what it's done is it's forced manufacturers to focus on other things to excel in, to really help give a great driving experience. You know, I think back to the days before the center console screen was an industry standard. And people would get into cars and the first thing they would look at is the stereo. Is it a good stereo? Does it play CDs? How many CDs can I hold in it? Will my phone connect to it? Does it have navigation? Nowadays, it's kind of the same concept, only now people are asking, how big is the screen? Is it responsive? And I will say that when I got into the Ionic 5 for the first time, I wasn't overly impressed by the screen. 
But that being said, I think Hyundai has done a great job in creating a balance between trying to overcompensate and offering the bare minimum. So I think the 12.3 inch screen may not be big enough for some people, but I think for most people, it will be a bigger screen than they're used to. Now onto that important question. Not necessarily if I would replace my Model 3 with this car, but rather would I consider it as a second EV in my garage? Well, two things I like to take out of the, the equation before I answer that question. Number one, my next EV purchase is going to be a truck in the next year to year and a half, and uh, hopefully it will be the Cybertruck. Number two, even though I had two good experiences with the Electrify America network, I'm still not convinced it's where it needs to be. So once we take those two out of the equation, absolutely, in its price range, I would certainly consider this. However, I feel as though I would need to give the Kia EV6 a try. I would also need to check out the VW ID4, the Ford Mustang Mach-E, just to name a few. Now I'm taking the Model Y out of the equation because it's not within that affordable range as far as I'm concerned. I would be looking at something more along the lines of a $50,000 range, give or take. This car and of course the other ones that I mentioned are within that range. Now, another thing, would I consider this if it was the only one available within this price range? And I would say an, an absolute yes to that. As I mentioned, as you saw, I had a good experience with this car. If there were no other options and I needed this now, I would be perfectly happy driving this car, taking it on road trips, and having it parked in my garage as my second EV. Well, that's gonna do it for this review. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Do you own an Ionic 5? Are you considering buying one? What are your thoughts on this car overall? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments section below. And of course, you know the drill. Like, subscribe, and stay positively charged.